a much bigger risk factor of cancer in general is obesity. Insulin resistance tied to that, perhaps. I mean, if you look at any of the cancer websites, being overweight is a risk factor. Hyperinsulinemia, huge, totally. huge risk factor for cancer. Right. So where protein comes in, that the um, conversation around that doesn't actually make sense. <laughs> Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What's going on, everybody? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Hope you guys are all crushing it in 2020. And I am so excited to be sharing this time with you. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave me a review on iTunes and other outlets where you are listening to it. It is doing awesome. And those reviews drive our ability to reach more people. So please leave me a review. I'm almost to 500 reviews. I want to crest that and then just race on over to 1,000 reviews. But thank you for considering leaving me a review. Let me know what I'm doing good. If you don't like the podcast, let me know what I'm not doing good and I'll try and make it better. But I appreciate you guys all being here and I love doing this. The Carnivore Code Book is getting so close. It's going to be out early next month, you guys, early in February. Probably the, uh, the plan right now is February 11th for the release date. And I am so, so stoked to share this with you guys. I have worked so hard on this book. If you still want to pre-order, you can do that at thecarnivorecodebook.com through the publisher, which is Indigo River. The book should be available for pre-order soon on Amazon as well. And I can't wait to share this thing with you guys. It has been nothing short of a labor of love. And I can't wait to see what you guys think. It is very well referenced. There are over 600 references. It's looking like about 350 pages. It's quite comprehensive. It goes over everything. So I, again, I cannot wait for this book to come out. It is my baby. And I can't wait to share it with you guys and girls. If you want to hear about cool things like this happening, be sure to sign up for my newsletter, which is available on my website, carnivoremd.com. You can get signed up for the Fundamental Health Insider. It comes out every week or two. I talk about an article. I talk about other cool stuff, and I will let you know what is going on. That is fun. The fun thing new that I have going on is that I have a new t-shirt, which you can find there. I don't even have them in my hands yet, but you guys can order them. It says Stay Radical on the front. Check that out. My guest on this week's podcast is none other than the amazing Dr. Gabrielle. Lyon. She is a functional medicine practitioner who works mostly out of New York City, doing private practice there. And she is an amazing individual that I have been hoping to have on the show for a long time. She calls her brand of medicine muscle-centric medicine, which I think is amazing. You will hear us talk about it in this podcast. She is working to leverage evidence-based medicine with emerging cutting-edge science to restore metabolism, balance hormones, optimize body composition. She is a baller. She's amazing. We go into mTOR. We go into the need for protein. We go into protein as your life source. We go into protein myths. We go into all kinds of science about this, and um, she knows her stuff. So she was previously an athlete doing figure competitions, now lifting lots of heavy weights and raising an amazing family. And as a bonus, at the end of this podcast, you will hear that I got to hang out with her husband, Shane, who is now in medical school in New York City and previously was a Navy SEAL. We talk a little bit about his experience as the Navy SEALs, what Navy SEALs eat. We talk about what happens when Navy SEALs try to go plant-based. It didn't end well. And it wasn't him. It was one of his colleagues that tried to go plant-based. It did not go well. And we just talk about the kind of stuff that he saw from indigenous peoples during his time in the service. So this one was a super fun one. Thank you so much to Dr. Gabrielle Lyon and Shane for coming on, future Dr. Shane. And you will hear a little bit. They have a beautiful five-month-old baby named Aries who makes an appearance at the end of the podcast. As always, this podcast is available on all of the media spaces and on YouTube if you want to see the video and that stuff. You guys, I have to thank my sponsors who are amazing. The first is White Oak Pastures. This is a regenerative farm in Georgia leading the way when it comes to renewable agriculture. If you are not familiar with the conversations around agriculture and carbon emissions, I would urge you to try and educate yourself because what is so outstanding and so arresting about what this farm is doing is that based on a life cycle analysis, we can show that when we raise cows, when we raise ruminants and animals together, 
we can become carbon negative, meaning that we can enrich the soil with so many nutrients that we can sequester nutrients into the soil and the overall carbon emissions are negative. Beyond Burger can't say that. Impossible Burger can't say that. You know what? White Oak Pastures meat is more carbon friendly than any plant-based burger. And as we know, plant-based agriculture is destroying the planet with monocropping, depleting the topsoil of nutrients is absolutely not sustainable. But the folks at White Oak Pastures are amazing. You can go to whiteoakpastures.com. You can use the code CARNIVOREMD to get 10% off your first order. They have grass-fed, grass-finished lamb, turkey, beef. Oh, the turkey's not grass-finished. You get what I'm saying. Grass-finished turkey, you get it. Duck, beef, Iberian hogs, which are delicious. It's amazing. And next year, we had such a good time at White Oak Pastures, White Oak Cella this year. We're going to do again in October. It's going to, excuse me, I made a mistake. In May 2020, we're going to do it again in May. It's going to be May 3rd and 4th, which I believe is a Saturday and Sunday, the first weekend of May. I want to see all of you guys there. You're going to see details about that soon. Come to White Oak Cella. Let's tour the farm, ride horses. We're going to grill meat. There's going to be music. I'm going to give a talk. I'm hoping my buddy, Dr. Ken Berry, is going to be there. Hopefully, I'll get some other radical folks there to give a few talks. We're going to just be hanging out in Georgia, in Southern Georgia, in uh, a beautiful space, looking at how agriculture and farming of animals done in a conscious way can really change the world. I believe this so wholeheartedly. You can also go to my landing page for White Oak Pastures, which is info.whiteoakpastures.com front slash carnivore MD. You can use the code carnivore 15 there to get 10 or 15% off, I think it's 15% off, whatever is on special. And recently it has been skirt steak, beef oxtail, and a big grass steak, which is a three pound grass fed steak. It's amazing stuff, you guys. These folks are doing it right. They have organs as two. They have bones for bone uh, meal or bone marrow or stock. White Oak is amazing. I love them. Check them out. And this is how we support change in the wider context Um, of our planet and our atmosphere and how we are good stewards of the land and how we eat some of the best animals in the world. Um, My other buddies are the folks at Ancestral Supplements. I love these guys. They are bringing us all grass-fed, grass-finished, New Zealand-based supplements of organ meats, which are sometimes hard for us to eat, encapsulated into gelatin capsules. So it makes it so easy. I love this when I'm traveling, if I can't get brain, if I can't get liver. I really appreciate them. My favorites are the liver, the organ complex, the intestines. There's so many good ones. The brain is great too. Uh, The intestines are amazing. And then they have come out with some new products, including tallow. You can get extra fat in a capsule, which is awesome because it improves the absorption of fat-soluble nutrients in other ancestral supplements, uh, pills, capsules, or the organs that you're eating or the food you're eating in general. We know that we need fat. We know that some of the most vital tribes, the most vital indigenous people on the planet always sought out the fat, fattiest animals and fat from animals first. Uh, I really believe that fat is the center of our diet. And if we neglect that, we can become deficient in fat soluble vitamins, which is not a good thing. And so it's cool. They're offering tallow in capsules. So check out Ancestral Supplements. This is www.ancestralsupplements.com. You can use the code SALADINOMD at their Shopify site to get 10% off your order. They will know that I sent you. And I, again, this is nose to tail, in my opinion, is the way to do it. And for those of us that don't like organs, can't eat organs, don't have access to organs, these are a fantastic option or just we can't get access to the special organs that Ancestral is offering and their line is expanding. They are doing awesome, awesome stuff. They are putting back in what the modern world has left out. I love these guys. They are good people. Check them out on Instagram too, Ancestral Supplements. I've been encouraging them to post more of their workouts because these are some fit men and women and they are crushing it in Texas and um, they deserve our support because they are doing good work. All right, you guys, on to the podcast. Let me know what you think of this one. I will see you after the episode for what is going on with me. All right. Gabrielle Lyon, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm glad this worked out. I'm glad it worked out too. We're hanging out here in Encinitas. You're visiting San Diego and I hope you guys are digging it here. Yeah. Well, you know, my husband had spent some time in Coronado and, you know, I had come out here for many years. So this is like our home away from home. I know. Maybe it'll be your home eventually once <laughs> once your husband gets out of medical school and if you guys end up here, we'll all go surfing sometime. Yeah. Maybe Aries will be old enough to surf with us. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> well, I have gotten a lot of requests for you to come on the podcast and I know you've had people that were interested in hearing our conversation. So let's just get right into it. I think that, that 
I really love the way that you've constructed this narrative around protein and the importance of muscle, but why don't you just give us a little bit of idea of your background? I think most people listening to this will know who you are, um, but how did you get into yeah. this and where, where, where did all of this come from? <laughs> so, um, well, I, you know, I did my undergraduate in human nutrition, vitamin mineral metabolism, and I was trained by Dr. Donald Lehman. And we all know who he is, or if you're in the protein space, he's one of the godfathers of protein. Um, and he's been training me for, gosh, I don't even want to say two decades, but pretty close. And um, just based on that understanding and that learning of exercise and protein metabolism, it really changed the trajectory of the way I practice medicine. And that's where this concept of muscle-centric medicine was born. And it's really uh, based on high protein. And when you say high protein, I think this term, it's all relative, right? Right. That's a really good point. I should say optimal protein. That would be a much better way because I think of it, saying it. People will sometimes say to me, the carnivore diet is extreme. And I say, extreme relative to what? The standard it's American diet? It's a really good diet? point, actually. Yeah. And so when you say high protein, it's high protein relative to the standard American, American diet, diet yes. which I think, as you and Don have pointed out repeatedly so well, is abysmally low in protein. That's right. I mean, because we know that the RDA 0.8 grams per kilogram is just enough to save off disease. That's it. I mean, this is a bare minimum requirement. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so not enough. And so when I've heard you think about protein and talk about another podcast, I really like this and I want to recapitulate this for the listeners. Yes. And when I've heard you talk about this, I think about my parents who are both 69 years old. Mm. And I'm thinking they are not getting enough protein. So there are a few pieces to this equation. The amount of protein that we need to stimulate muscle protein synthesis throughout the day. Yes, sir. And then the way that this requirement might change as we age. Right. So let's not even think about my parents just yet. Let's just think about for the general public who are middle age between maybe 20 and 50 years old or 55, mm -hmm. what is protein doing when we eat it? And what does it mean when we eat enough protein? So let's um, talk about protein and what we're really eating for is amino acids. Mm -hmm. And in particular, when we're talking about muscle protein synthesis and healthy muscle, you're really eating for those branched chain amino acids. So you're making sure that you're getting enough leucine per meal. So it's not necessarily the protein, right? Because you've got pea protein and soy protein, but it, it is really the amino acids that are necessary. So as you age, you get this thing called anabolic resistance, right? So the protein that you ingest becomes, it, it doesn't quite stimulate the body the way that it should the way that it did maybe perhaps when you were in your 20s. So you require more of this over a period of time, which I'm sure you're well aware. And then what's happening though right now is that there's this anti-animal narrative. So we're talking about having more plant-based proteins. That is the single worst piece of advice that I could ever give anyone. And I actually trained as a geriatrician. So after doing two residencies and a fellowship in geriatrics and obesity medicine, my job was to help aging individuals. And the single, I'll say it again, worst piece of advice you could ever give someone who's aging. And I have to say, we're all aging. I was joking with my husband, I was thinking, man, I'm getting old, you know, but we're all aging and our tissues are aging. So. And so from your perspective, what is so bad about the plant protein? Well, it's not that it's so bad. It's that when you're younger, you have more flexibility, right? right? So you can kind of do whatever you want and eat a diet that is maybe suboptimal in protein. And you'll manage, right? Because at a young age, you're driven by hormones. Exactly. I've heard you talk about this before. That yeah. probably, I mean, who knows when that stops? But let's just say up right. until like we, 20 we, years old or something. Right. We are driven, a lot of the muscle protein synthesis and the muscle sort of biogenesis is driven by our hormonal milieu. Yes, sir. Right. And then... And then as we advance in age, the other way to then stimulate it is through resistance training and protein. Right. Um, but as we age, that becomes more challenging. So having high quality protein, really, you know, even as you're young. So yes, you can get away with it in your 20s. But if you have any issues with body composition, which people do now, they're fatter than ever. The obesogenic model of an individual is also similar to an aging individual when it comes to tissue. Mm -hmm. In terms of the way that muscle responds exactly. to protein or needs protein. That's right. You, you talk about this term muscle protein resistance or muscle. Well, you mean in terms anabolic of- Anabolic resistance yes, of the muscle. anabolic resistance, yes. Okay, and this is a concept that's 
surrounding the fact that you need more protein to you trigger do. mTOR. Yes. This sort of anabolic pathway. If yes. we just sort of group all of the anabolic pathways under the umbrella of mTOR, yeah. which is the mammalian target of rapamycin, and it's balanced by the AMP kinase pathway, we can yeah. talk about that too. But this is an interesting concept that as we age, and it probably, who knows what the slope of the line looks like, but as we age- And we, we don't know. We right. don't actually know. The trajectory of aging as we know it, I mean, it could start in your 30s. So mm -hmm. the more in, the more the body is inflamed, the more obese it is, the, the less healthy the muscle tissue. And the less responsive the muscle tissue will be to right. amino acid stimuli. And you know, there's other things like splanchnic extraction that you know, you're not actually absorbing it in the way that you did when you were younger. So there are other things, but really to simplify it for the audience and to simplify it for people to think about it, it really is a, a tissue amino acid issue. Oh, this audience is sophisticated. Uh, they yeah, want, they want details. Listen, I know, I know. <laughs> they want nerdy stuff. We're gonna get as deep as we can. So, okay, so I'm thinking now, let's talk about the, the threshold. So what I've heard you and Don talk about is 2.6 grams of leucine per meal or in, in a meal to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Right. Do you think that's a reasonable number? Right, and the RDA is like, uh, I think we're looking at it, I wanna say it's, three to four grams. I, I cannot remember, but it is at least, ha you know, it's like nothing. Yeah, the, it's three to four grams. Three to four grams of, is of, the leucine. of leucine. Of leucine. Per day. Per day. And we know that we need... 2.6. That's right. Like in a, one meal. Yes, sir. Right. To Easy. trigger sort of the switch. Mm -hmm. That means muscle turns on, muscle sort of repairs, muscle is maintained. Is that what, that's, what hap that's what's happening when we get this yes. sort of leucine trigger is the signal to the muscle to say, stay where you are, maintain your strength, maintain your vitality, maintain the lean mass in the body. So yes, but that, you know, and I've spoken with Don about this. He would argue that the muscle protein syn synthesis, you can't directly correlate it to uh -huh. um, actually laying down tissue, but it's the best that we can do. And it, it makes sense. Right. Right. I mean, it's a very dynamic process um, in terms of the studies that it, it's thought to. He would correct me if I say, yes, absolutely. When that happens, you're laying down tissue. Right. Not sure that dynamically it totally works like that, but it's the best understanding that we have. But it's sort of a main, it's at least, it seems like it's a maintenance signal to the muscle to say, for sure, you are needed. Here's a reservoir for amino acids. We're going to give you the exactly. stimulus and you should stay where you are in terms of strength and volume. Et yes. And then, so it's all about that kind of leucine trigger, which is one of the three branch chain amino acids, leucine, mm -hmm. isoleucine, and valine. And the this came up on the recent podcast I did in response to James Wilkes and Chris Kresser because um, in that podcast uh, on Joe Rogan, James Wilkes makes a point about adequate amounts of protein or similar amounts of protein between a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and three ounces of meat. And then he goes on to say that it's all about the leucine content of the food for triggering muscle synthesis, which is right. But what I think was neglected in that podcast was the actual nuts and bolts of how much plant material we would have to eat to get 2.6 grams of leucine. And you know, this is a really important point. And it's an important point because these are hard, fast biological numbers. There's no argument that high quality protein, you know, what a high quality protein is. So it's so interesting that this was taken to kind of extrapolate saying, oh, this protein is equal. And that, you know, you can get away with plant-based proteins and, and then it's, I mean, you can, but a peanut butter sandwich is not equal to beef. But it's not even arguable. I mean, there's so much in science that we can argue. You know, there's the whole story about mTOR and, and which we'll talk about, you know, like whether initiation, prolongation of cancer and, and you know, as a growth promoter, people can argue whatever they want. One of the things that we cannot argue that is hard and fast is the quality of protein. The amino acids are the amino acids. It's weird. It's great to have something that's objective like that though, right? But it's not even an art... It, it's not even arguable. Exactly. And I really try to, you know, eliminate my confirmation bias. I, I am biased. I was trained by a world leading protein expert, right? Like, but he has taught me to look at things objectively. Truly, he is not in favor of one camp or the other, right? He's a scientist. Don is not uh, opinionated in that way. He's very data driven. 
These are hard and fast numbers. Ama- around the actual amounts of leucine in specific proteins. Yeah, yeah, and determining quality. Exactly. And we can talk about the quality too. And the quality, when you say quality, do you mean bioavailability, like a DIAS score, which we can talk about? Or do you mean quality based on the amino acid ratios, like the leucine? Yes, purely based. I mean, because when you talk about, you know, it's really easy to get essential and non essential amino acids, right. truly. Right, that's not the issue. Mm -hmm. We are talking about having enough amino acids at a particular dose to trigger a physiological response. And specifically, if we just break it down, we're thinking leucine here. You can't, right. So arguably, an individual will be getting enough, I don't know, you pick it, uh, you know, if they're eating a full, I mean, just pick any of the amino acids. Chances are you'll get it. You know, lysine is an is a limiting amino acid in methionine, right? Mm-hmm. There's some methionine restriction, which is possible that that can work. You know, so a lot of the vegan vegetarianism kind of model or the fasting mimicking diet is essentially methionine restriction. Right. Um, but, you know, chances are you'll be getting enough amino acids, but we're talking about optimization, Right. And when we're talking, yeah. I guess we're talking about two different sides of the coin there. If we're talking about methionine restriction, which I want to talk about. Sure. We've talked about that in the past, kind of the methionine glycine ratio, and that's Walter Longo's fasting mimicking diet. But if we're talking about actual maintenance of muscle for my parents, for you, for me, for it all is, of us. It's about, it's about all the amino acids, but it's in particular about leucine. And people right. have gotten this wrong for decades. Right. You know, and you and I were talking before we were actually talking uh, on rec- you know, recording on the ProDage study. And that's a really important kind of landmark piece. Um, Not because it's so outrageous in its recommendations or, um, you know, um, mind expanding, but what it does is it does a very good job at showing everything that we've made these global health recommendations. You know, the RDA is being good for everyone has been wrong. We're wrong. And I just pulled this study up. Um, the I think the I think this is the study. The actual title of the study is "Evidence Based Recommendations yes. for Optimal Dietary Protein Intake in Older People: A Position Favor Paper from the Prot Age Study Group." Yeah. And the, basically, the conclusion is that as we age, we need more protein to trigger this response, and as we age, we need more protein. That's right. Which is, and I want to talk about this too, which really flies in the face of this narrative that is growing yes. now that we should be limiting our animal protein from truly. Stephen Gundry and others yes. in the space. And it's dangerous. So th- this is actually dangerous advice. And, you know, it's interesting when you look at the age of people arguing. I mean, what? They're, you know, between 20 and 50. That's, I mean, okay. But I don't see people as they age argue. I mean, I don't know. I don't know that in terms of plant-based, it's the worst piece of advice you give people. Because? They cannot sustain. So let's say, okay, so let's just take a step back. Muscle is directly related to mortality and morbidity, right? So the, the stronger you are, the more muscle mass you have, the better your survival. Cancer. What kills individuals with cancer? They will die from cachexia. Right. Which is muscle wasting. Mm-hmm. That kills them. So if you fall and you break a hip, you end up in the hospital. And you have sarcopenia, which is a disease of, considered a disease of aging, which is loss of muscle tissue, um, loss of strength, you will never make it out. And I find it so fascinating in the space of everybody talking about this. I have been at the bedside of hundreds of dying of indi- dying individuals. Me, sitting there, where everyone else is talking about, oh, you should go plant-based and it doesn't matter as you age and you should continue to fast and it doesn't matter as you age. I'm thinking to myself, you know, how many of you have actually sat there? I am telling you that experience would change that narrative. It would change the story. Well, one of the things that I think is so striking is if you look at the proponents of a plant-based diet, whether it's Joel Furman, Dr. Greger, Michael Greger, yeah. Dean Ornish, they have cachexia. <laughs> they essentially are cachectic. They are so skinny. And as you're talking about this cancer cachexia, which is the loss of yeah. muscle mass in sort of an inflammatory process, or sarcopenia, which is the yeah. loss of muscle mass as we age, I'm thinking of sort of an amino acid reservoir in the human body. Right. And muscle is this amino acid reservoir. You know, if somebody's playing a video game, they have this bar that goes across, and that's their life force. Yes. And I, that's, think we, I love that. I think yeah. we can think about the amount of muscle on your body as an amino acid reservoir, which is almost like your life uh-huh. force. And 
if our life force goes down, if our amino acid reservoir goes down, we are getting closer to the next life. We yes. are getting closer to dying. So it's true. And yeah. yeah. And so as when someone is having cancer, they are depleting that amino acid reservoir and then they will die. And what people are advocating for, Stephen Gundry and others, is to avoid animal protein because it's going to trigger mTOR too much. And I think that, as you're suggesting, it's going to lead to, basically what that's doing is depleting our amino acid reservoir. So, um, so mTOR, as you talked about earlier, um, these are all great points. And when you think about mTOR, exercise is also a stimulator exactly. of mTOR. So, um, you know, they it's weird where they get this story that mTOR is bad. So mTOR is a growth pathway. Cancer, in order for cancer to happen, first of all, if you, t if you think about cancer, you've got lung, ovarian, colon, uterine, right? Um, lung is the number one killer, which isn't a metabolic disease. And our survival hasn't really changed. Right. I mean, so what cancer are we talking about? A much bigger risk factor of cancer in general is obesity. Insulin resistance tied to that, perhaps. I mean, if you look at any of the cancer websites, being overweight is a risk factor. Hyperinsulinemia, huge, totally. huge risk factor for cancer. Right. So where protein comes in, that the um, conversation around that doesn't actually make sense. And I've spoken to Don at length about this, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is a guy who's been studying it for 40 years. I mean, this is what he does. And um, it doesn't make sense. So you and I were talking about some of the the uh, rat studies where they said uh, mTOR. I don't even remember what the study was. Well, I think it's a series of studies that were done in in animal models, which we talked about. That you said were ad libitum. So it's it's there's the rats can just overfeed. Yep. And they connected protein consumption with overactivation of mTOR. And one of the things I'd heard you mention on previous podcasts is that this is a really bad model for humans. It and is. That, that there's really, I mean, in your opinion, in Don's opinion, is there really good evidence no. that protein is linked to overactivating mTOR in cancer? So protein and cancer, it's is there never, a connection? So the relative risk, so when we talk about relative risk, when we talk about the risk of doing this, will, you know, the likelihood of an outcome of this. So smoking and cancer. Right. For something to be considered relevant, it has to be over two. For the relative risk. Relative, yeah. Right. It has to be over two. So if smoking and cancer is 12, we think that there's a risk. Pretty big relative risk. Totally. All the data for protein and cancer is 1.2, maybe 1.3. Right. Within the range of probably what is. So that is considered, error. that no, is considered no risk. Right. So my question to these individuals would be well, if this is what the data is showing, and you have an opinion that it doesn't support the data, where is this coming from? It's, and also, yeah. wait, I just have to say, a much bigger driver of mTOR is insulin. Exactly. So we're talking about protein. So the whole protein story is a complete mess. So when you think about cancer, you think about initiation, right? An initiation factor and then a growth phase. So um, when in the history of ever has it ever been shown that protein initiates cancer? I, I mean, we've never seen it. No. No, we've never seen it. And yet it's kind of this inferred, subtle propaganda part of this narrative. Is it that is. That's the, that, so that's the truth. The truth is it's a propaganda narrative. Mm -hmm. It's an anti-animal propaganda narrative. That, and, and I don't even understand why people will demonize animals so far. So like I know Gundry, why. I know why. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I know why. Why? Um, so the anti-animal narrative is that um, the majority of people don't care about eating animals. You'll eat an animal, I'll eat an animal, no one cares. So what are you gonna do? You have to go after something to scare people. Right. So I don't care about eating animals. Sam down the street doesn't care about eating animals, but they care about your health and they care about the environment. So I'm gonna create a bunch of lies and make a whole bunch of stuff up that you're gonna care about. And that's where the narrative comes from. It's this emotional, yeah. This emotional propaganda narrative around it. Yeah. And they'll even say animal protein. So there's... Um, the original superfood. <laughs> exactly. Like the ori <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I mean, like, really? Yes. Like the thing that made us human yeah. throughout our evolution, the True. thing that has fueled the growth of our brains mm -hmm. and probably 
the change the course of our evolution as humans and pre-hominids two million years ago right. animal foods is now being demonized and said and people like Stephen Gundry and others I wonder why I wonder what is at the core and I wonder you know my my question is is there going to be mental flexibility so let's say for example the people that you're mentioning uh, fall and break hip and aren't doing well or they watch their parents pass away or they watch something devastating happen where they their bodies cannot support their choices. I truly wonder if they are going to be so wedded to their belief as opposed to, you know, being open-minded. Part of being an expert is also to be open-minded. It's not, you know, science changes a lot. A, you know, for a long time, people thought taking amino acids was great. You know, and really the only time you need amino acids is if you are deficient or, you know, if you're having a lower protein meal. I mean, they're, the science evolves, you know? It'll be interesting to see what happens to many of these people as they age. I mean, some of these plant-based advocates and the advocates for lower animal protein are, are not young. And it's going to be interesting to see. They will. I do not think that they will age well. But um, I, I keep throwing Gundry under the bus. I did a debate with him directly, mm. and people know that I've discussed all this directly with him. So he's I'm, he's the lectin guy, right? He's the lectin guy. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that he was anti-animal. He's very anti-animal protein. And I worked with one of his clients, and he had. She was a 75 year old woman, and he had her on 19 grams of protein per day. So that's devastating. That's like that's devastating. Malpractice, in my opinion. That's devastating. And but it's from the opinion that we don't want to overstimulate mTOR. And so- But what does that mean? Exactly. But, but so, so mTOR is in every cell. mTOR in the muscle is different than mTOR in the liver that's different than mTOR in the kidneys. It's different. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about mTOR in the liver may be much more sensitive to insulin, whereas mTOR in the muscle is uniquely sensitive to branched chain amino acids. Mm -hmm. So that science is incorrect when you're saying you're a 70 some year old woman and you should- stop stimulating mTOR, that message is incorrect. And I think that, let's just dig into this, because we kind of touched on it for a second, or maybe just recapitulate the idea that this is a false narrative. This is a false connection, that there is a true linear connection or relationship between mTOR and cancer. It's made up. I mean, right. we talked about the relative risk. The data does not support that. And I think that a lot of this maybe comes from like the Laurent dwarves, these people who have this growth hormone receptor deficiency, and they have very low IGF-1, and they don't have cancer, but they're also three and a half feet tall. They have massive sleep problems. They have severe um, insulin resistance and other metabolic hormonal disturbances. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know where people are getting this idea. And I, it just astounds me that it has been so promulgated and just become so magnified that people are associating mTOR with cancer. I get this question all the time. It's so weird. On a it's carnivore diet, not... it's like, aren't you worried about overstimulating mTOR? And I think, no, I'm absolutely not. Right, and we know that the biggest driver of mTOR is insulin. Insulin, yep. Yeah. And I'm I'm sure that I people know that I've talked about that study in the past with the human myotubes, you know, and if you look, it, it's done in cell culture, but if I think that, I guess it's probably a muscle cell that they're using in cell culture and they're comparing leucine and insulin uh -huh. and the insulin stimulates mTOR in a much greater way, absolutely, and then for a longer period of time than the leucine. Is this what, are you familiar with that same? I'm not familiar with the study, but I am familiar with the science behind the way mTOR works and in terms of protein, you do it does generate a phase one insulin release which the, is the preformed insulin and in terms of stimulating mTOR it's not a, a negative mm -hmm. for the tissue well let's talk about that because I've heard you speak about this in the past on their podcast as well and I want to clarify this for people talk to me about the difference between the way protein is going to stimulate insulin and the way carbohydrates <laughs> right. are going to stimulate insulin so um it's really also based on amount so uh -huh. a phase one insulin release is what's preformed in your body and anything really less than 40 grams of, say, protein, you know, you know, really carbohydrates is not going to get to that phase two. Mm -hmm. So the phase two is that big insulin spike, which is what you don't want. You don't want to overstimulate the pancreas. You don't want your blood sugar to drop. And then you're constantly chasing. Right. Right. You're at, you're at this chasing blood sugar. Mm -hmm. um, protein does stimulate insulin release, but it's preformed insulin. Mm -hmm. And it's necessary for muscle growth. Right. It's not a negative thing. Mm -hmm. And... If you were to, you know, and in terms of the extent at which protein would stimulate insulin, it would never even be close to the amount that it would for carbohydrates. And there's some context there as well, isn't there? Because I've seen some data that Ben Beekman has presented, I think it's in dogs, that 
when you're not, so when you're ketogenic or perhaps fat adapted, and I'm not exactly sure how we quantify that physiologically, the insulin response from protein is less than it is on a carbohydrate based diet. Have you seen anything about that? I haven't seen the the data, but the, you know, your body does adapt to if you are uh, predominantly carbohydrate or keto adapted. I mean, the, the fuel systems will adapt right. to that. And my sense is that when you are keto adapted, that the insulin response to protein is lower because it almost has to be right. Because if you're running on ketones and you suddenly eat like you and I might do, you know, many times a day or twice a day, I had a big bolus of protein at four o'clock today before I came over here. I had a ste- I had like, you know, maybe 14 ounces of steak, 16 ounces of steak. I'm in a ketogenic, I'm on a ketogenic diet. I haven't had any carbohydrates today other than the like small amount of glycogen that's in that muscle meat. Yeah. And if I got well, and protein big, will, you know, turn, you know, for every hundred grams of protein, you'll generate 60 grams of glucose through gluconeogenesis. Right. And I want to talk about that too. Sure. But if I had had a huge insulin spike yeah. with that meat, I would not have had anything to run on because there's right. all the glucose or a lot of the glucose in my blood would have gone down, would have been shunted into muscles. Right. I'm not taking in any glucose. And when I have a big spike in insulin, it's going to shut off the production of ketones. I wouldn't have anything for my brain to run on. So there almost has to be a different physiologic switch where I think it has to do with the insulin glucagon ratio. And that is different when you're on a ketogenic diet than it is on a mixed diet. Because um, our, our mutual friend Lane loves to point out, Lane Norton loves to point out that protein and carbohydrates both stimulate insulin. Yeah. And I think Lane is right with his point, which is that insulin in and of itself does not make us fat. Um, because he's saying, look, protein stimulates insulin. But I also think that the study he's quoting is could would probably be different if it were done on people who are keto adapted in terms of that protein insulin response. What do you think? I mean, I'd, I'd have to see it. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to see it. It's, it's an interesting concept, though. And I think that there's there's some nuance there for sure. So so let's go ahead. Let's circle back to gluconeogenesis a little bit. Because yeah. you talked about that. And I would love to tell you what um, I see in my patients yeah. that are on a higher carbohydrate di- or a higher protein diet. Yeah, yeah. More optimal protein. Optimal protein. Um, because uh, it was really interesting. I had a woman come in and uh, her hemoglobin A1C was 5.7, which is fine. Um, but the, her doctor was like, oh, you know, like you're pre-diabetic, you have to really watch your diet and, you know, go more plant-based. This is true. <laughs> but anyway, it's fine. Um, she came in, she was really upset. And so those individuals on a higher protein diet or more optimal protein go through gluconeogenesis. So their blood sugar remains stable. So you'll see their insulin, their fasting insulin is very low, less than five. Right but their hemoglobin A1C might be on the higher level, might be on the higher side. And it's just because their blood sugar is more stable. And I see this a lot, and I've always wondered, I've heard others talk about sort of the inaccuracies in hemoglobin A1C, and Mm -hmm. I wonder about this as well, because in the people I work with who are on carnivore diets, I will see a fasting glucose, usually anywhere from 80 to 93 maybe. And then I'll see, sometimes I'll see a hemoglobin A1C that is 5.6, which is an average blood glucose of 116 or 120. Mm -hmm. And I think they're eating a carnivore diet. If I had a CGM, I bet their blood sugar never crests 100 in a day. And yet their hemoglobin A1C says the average blood sugar is 120. Well, your blood, um, the, uh, on that kind of nutrition plan, the, uh, the life cycle of the red blood cells longer. Is, is, I've, yeah. I've wondered about that. Yeah. I think I'd heard Red Rob Wolf talk about that. It's, it's longer. And that and that would be totally confounding. So I'll have to get that literature from you because that is interesting. So is, is, this, is it on a ketogenic diet or what? So I'm not a big fan. So personally, right, I definitely don't promote a ketogenic diet. It's uh-huh. just not something that I've, you know, I see a lot of women, you know, maybe the, the military guys, depending on if, you know, they've had brain trauma, things like that. But, you know, I don't do a ton, I don't, I haven't seen a ton of great benefit from a ketogenic diet. Oh, interesting. Okay. You know, which is, you know, if my patients are going to do it, I mean, I totally support them. Right. Um, but in terms of that, uh, their blood work, I think that's what you asked me. Well, I was, I, <laughs> I think this well, is what happens when you have a baby. <laughs> Baby's up at three, you're up at three. <laughs> it's like, it's creativity. <laughs> I heard like, this, I heard this amazing podcast with Tim Ferriss talking to someone 
Um, and he was saying that he liked being a little fuzzy because it led to more creativity. <laughs> so whenever I don't... I don't, but, you know, but you saw her. She's cute and worth it. She's really cute and definitely <laughs> worth it, I'm sure. And and your your husband is doing the heroic thing right now. And uh, I'm sure she's missing you. So I want to talk about the ketogenic diet stuff yeah. as well. But I think that this idea that the red blood cell, the life yes, of the red blood longer. cell can be lo- increased on a ketogenic diet is fascinating to me because I do see hemoglobin A1Cs that appear to be spuriously elevated, and mm-hmm. I don't use that. Do you have patients on s- continuous glucose monitors I in do. your clinic? And I put my husband on one. Really? I do, yes. And do you see this type of thing because, uh, do you see a discordance between yes. what the CGM says and what the A1C yeah. might say? So the continuous glucose monitor is, I just see them, um, like you said, they don't really go that high. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't see them go over 100. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And then you you'll see- You could also do a fructosamine. Yeah. Um, which would be a shorter measure. Which is a shorter measure. I think two weeks, mm-hmm. um, two or three weeks. But, you know, I think a much better evaluation is either you do an oral glucose col- tolerance test or you just look at their um, fasting insulin. Right. And the thing about an OGTT, which is tough for me for a lot of these patients, is that I think that unless they're eating carbohydrates, if they're coming That's straight, good point. if they're coming yes. straight from a carnivore diet, and mm-hmm. people should know this, that if That's they're very good point. if they're on a low carbohydrate diet and they do an OGTT for pregnancy or whatever, they're probably going to fail. But if you eat carbohydrates for a few days, your body adapts, and it's not the same thing as like a physiologic inflammatory insulin resistance. Right. It's I think I've heard Ben Beacon call it like glucose sparing, some other terminology. So so that's a confusing thing, right? It is. I think a fasting insulin is probably a good indication though. And in these patients, that's what I see. I'll see a fasting insulin sometimes lower than two or mm-hmm. three. And I think, yeah, I don't think you're insulin resistant. No. And I don't get too worried about the fasting glucose creeping up and I see variability between And their fasting all those glucose will be a little higher. Also their cortisol is a little bit higher. Really? Yep. Hmm. Overall. And um, you know, I'm not exactly sure why, mm-hmm. but that's just what I've seen from my years in practice is that cortisol remains a little bit higher. In people on ketogenic diets or uh, low just, carb diets? You know, more of a carnivore type uh-huh. uh, higher protein, which is what I am myself. Uh-huh. Um, cortisol just runs higher. And is the curve different? Are you doing like 24 hour salivary cortisol curves or I do, do you see AM cortisols that are I higher? Both. I do both. Uh huh. And so, how much higher do you think that AM cortisol is? Just a little higher? Um, I would say it's definitely, you know, it depends on what lab you're using, right? Right. You know, if it's in house lab or, or wherever. Um, I would say it is definitely mid-range and above, which is higher for most people. Interesting. Yeah. And then do you see any changes in the 24-hour cortisol curve? So that is all dependent. It's mostly the morning that I see higher. Just the morning Um, cortisol spike. Yeah. And I have no data to even understand why this is. Right. You know, I don't actually know. Um, Yeah. I don't know. It kind of makes sense physiologically. We're going to get a cortisol spike in the morning. But in terms of those on a higher protein diet. Right. And Don has seen the same thing in all his studies. It goes a little higher. It's higher. And you know, some of these... And actually, for him, we were talking about it, it's higher overall. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think you can make an argument that that cortisol awakening response, a higher might be better. I mean, if you look at, if you talk to people from like precision labs, Mm -hmm. looking at like a Dutch, like a dried urine or a 24-hour cortisol curve, they want that fasting, that that AM cortisol awakening response to be higher. So I wonder, I mean, it may not necessarily be a bad thing to I, have a higher AM I, cortisol. I would agree with you. you the, think so? Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, my healthiest patients are those that are, they're definitely optimized on protein and maybe, you know, of course, this is my opinion. This is what I do in my clinic. Right. But- no, I think it's interesting. You know, it, it makes sense. Yeah. And I did a recent debate with Chris Masterjohn, and some of the studies that I reviewed for that one show that once you're keto adapted, um, that there's that there's really no difference in the cortisol overall for people. Mm. So be interesting. I think we need new terminology around this, actually, yeah. because keto and ketogenic diets, I think, can mean so many things. Yes. And there are people doing very high fat keto, which could have but low protein. I thought it's just a standard. I thought it's a standard. It's 70% or more of your fat comes from, or 70% or more of your calories come from fat. I, I, I mean, I, is there, I don't know. Is I, there other definition of well, a ketogenic? There's like, there's like this medical ketogenic diet with four to one fat okay. to protein ratio in terms of grams that is used for kids with epilepsy. Yes. And then in people who are doing low carb. And that's where it originated from, the ketogenic diet, right? Exactly. For, for seizures. And then. And that, a lot of people will refer to And then those, there's a protein sparing fast. Exactly. Which is. 
totally different. <laughs> yeah. But people will refer to those old studies with medical ketogenic diets, which were a four to one ratio. Okay. And that is going to have different physiologic effects on the body because <clears throat> it's not enough protein, right? Yeah. They're very low protein. And so I almost feel like right. we need this like a, a, a keto light designation or a, <laughs> I, I, I like the word low carb, but that gets to be very murky too, because what is low carb? Is it less than 50? Is it less, mm-hmm. than, less than 100 grams? Am I low carb? I don't have any carbohydrates in my diet, technically speaking, but I have a lot of protein. So <clears throat> I think that the endpoints we're using are probably quite misleading. But ultimately what I see in my diet is that my ketones are going to be pretty low most of the time. I don't end up with like high levels Which would make sense. of ketosis because I have a lot of protein. And so I, you're not on a ketogenic diet? Probably not. No. I think that, that would make sense. Yeah. I think that a lot of carnivore diets don't necessarily have to be ketogenic or- I would say that they are not. It's so interesting because everyone's talking about carnivore, which I have been largely carnivore for years. It's what I do best as. Uh-huh. But it doesn't mean that it's high fat. And you and I were talking about this when we first met. Right. Um, you know, we're talking about some of the rabbit starvation studies and really the only amount of uh, essential fatty acids you need, it's probably about four grams or so. So you can, and that's why the protein sparing fast worked. Those are very low carb. Those are very low fat diets. Exactly. So for listeners that may not be aware, protein sparing modified fast, and correct me if I get this wrong, is basically it's carbohydrate and fat limitation and just a yes. moderate amount of protein. So on a protein sparing- It's, a low, it's low calorie. It's around- 800 to 1,000 calories, and you're just eating protein, and then they supplement in some essential fatty acids. So That's it. it. On, okay, and so if you're getting 800 to 1,000 calories a day, you'd be getting maybe 200 grams of protein, quite a bit of protein. You know, yeah, it depends on the, the size of the, the yeah. person, but yeah. So it'd basically be, be like inducing a little bit of like low fat, low carb, yeah, and high protein, yes. and so it's protein sparing, but it's a sort of a modified fast because it's hypocaloric. Yes. And exactly. they're going to get and they're going to get a small amount of essential fatty acids. Yes. Which are you said like 4 grams yes. of probably mixed omega 3s and yeah. a few other things. Probably not a great thing to do long term. <laughs> no, no, it's it's really just for, you know, if there was a, a surgery or you know, you needed to get the weight off of an individual quickly. I think Cleveland Clinic has a great outline. I'll send it to you. It yeah. actually should, you know, pe- people shouldn't do it on their own. No. This is something that you should definitely do with a practitioner. A lot of these protein sparing fasts were actually done on inpatient units too. They put them in inpatient units, but I'll send it to you. It's very nicely done. The, yeah. Uh, the paper is very nicely done. And I think that it could help people lose weight very quickly. It does. But over, it does. If you overextend it, I think it could potentially have ramifications in terms of hormonal balance. It does. Right. And that's actually what I see on a ketogenic diet is that a lot of women don't do well, that there's this honeymoon phase. And then I see a lot of um, thyroid issues and hormonal issues with a ketogenic diet. And, you know, maybe it's something to be said that uh, individuals should cycle it. And do you think that's because they're not getting enough protein? What do you think it is? Because this is where I think we need more language that's more specific, right? Because you're saying these women are not doing well on a ketogenic diet. And I'm thinking, what is it about their ketogenic diet? Is it is it not enough protein? Is it not enough calories? Like, what is the what is the tipping point for them? And how are they constructing a quote unquote ketogenic diet? Great questions. Right. I think there has to be. I think that there becomes some kind of massive stressor to the body, mm-hmm. and it may not be based on uh, calories. And again, this is speculation, but something happens where their body becomes very stressed. And I think that this kind of echoes all of your stuff. I think that one of the major triggers here is not enough protein, you know? I mean, listen, I absolutely think that as a society, we're not doing it right. Mm-hmm. We're too low protein. We're high everything else. We waste food. Um, you know, people talk about environmental issues and greenhouse gas. People are wasting 40% of their food. They're throwing it out. Mm-hmm. Those avocados from Mexico that took all that transportation to get, they're throwing it out. They go in the garbage. Right? Nobody throws out steak. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, but, you know, we just have the the discussion and the narrative incorrect. Right. Right. So you've got the mouse with the microphone, this uh, select group of people who are very anti-animal and that they are really trying to change the trajectory of health. And uh, it's sad. I don't think that these people are malicious people. I think that they're clueless. And listen. There is some interesting aspect where plant-based vegan vegetarian diets can work. We're going to start to see some data that is actually being done right now where the microbiome does play a role and it, it has the capacity to extract amino acids. 
Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting. So some of those studies are going to be emerging, um, which is fascinating. On a plant-based diet. Yeah. So they can extract more amino acids. And they believe, you know, um, it. one of the working hypotheses and and some of the stuff that they're seeing uh, is that the microbiome, the bacteria are allowing either more extraction of amino acids and generation of amino acids. And actually when they die, the bugs die, the host, the body is actually able to get the amino acids they need. Is that vegan? (laughs) Isn't that wild? If you're digesting bacteria. But it's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, so there is something to be said for, you know, I I mean, I've seen some individuals do incredibly well on vegan vegetarian diets. And I always ask myself, well, why is that possible? So why are these individuals not completely wasted away? there is some metabolic flexibility that goes above and beyond what we know. Maybe the microbiome shifts in a massive way. I think that that's actually what happens. Are, have you seen people do well on vegan and plant-based diets long-term? I have not. Like, I, uh, two people out of <clears throat> the, I don't even know, I mean, I've probably seen thousands of people in my training. Probably, and I can picture them very well, two people. Beyond five years. I think of five years as like the cutoff. <laughs> I mean. I, I just, I mean, and... I guess, you know, people are looking at me and Sean Baker and other people who are in the carnivore community with the same sort of speculation saying you're going to crash in five years. But I I look at people on plant-based diets, which have been around at least popularized in the media longer than carnivore diets or animal-based diets. And people seem to crash after five years unless they are very meticulously supplementing is what I've seen. But I wasn't sure if you'd seen something different. Well, I... I think that the individuals that have the capacity to do well, actually there's three people that I've seen that have done phenomenal. Um, I think it has to do with their own bioindividuality and it does have to do with the capacity of their microbiome. And if I were to say that a year ago, I would be laughing at myself right now because it sounds so stupid. It really sounds dumb. But, uh, you know, as this data is starting to emerge, it makes sense. And I'm hearing this from people way smarter than me right? That are in there doing it, right? And that's what they're starting to find. And I think that it's a very few, it's very few, very few and far between individuals that will be able to do that. And they're going to know it. Right. You know, they're going to know. Exactly. And what we've seen is that the microbiome does shift with what, no matter what we eat. If, I mean, there's a study that was actually done at Harvard with a totally carnivorous diet versus a plant-based diet, and they saw- I haven't pe- been a super huge fan of, of Harvard's information coming out. I just want to say <laughs> I that. Know, I know, I mean, it's really bad. Well, I think they were trying to make an animal-based diet look bad in this study, but what I took out of the study was there was no decrease in alpha diversity, but there was a total shift in the flora in these two guts. So. And, and we should just, and I know this is kind of a little off topic, so you've got these groups, and you've got like groups at Harvard, and I you know. have groups that are uh, plant-based- vegan zealots that are producing information and it's not true so individuals that are listening you know and there's self a self-selected audience that has really sought you out which i commend you for you know kind of leading the charge in this way it's not always easy but always relevant right not always easy but always relevant um and sean baker does a great job he's a great Mm guy um the the people behind, you know, like at Harvard and these places that are vegan and, and just producing this information is, it's very dishonest. It's very biased. It's very dishonest. A lot of the studies are done, um, they're whatever, if they're quoting epidemiological data saying this is relevant, um, you know, and meta-analysis that are based on poor exclusion criteria. I mean, it's bad. So in the podcast that I did recently with Brian Sanders, we looked at the funding for the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard, which is what Walter Willett is. Yeah, the Walter Willett is, is um, kind yes. Of the, yeah, the, just leave it at that. He sits upon the throne yep. of darkness yep. at this it's, point. It's, it's really, um, yeah. I mean, the funding for T.H. Chan is all plant-based advocacy groups and it's all like it, they are getting hundreds of thousands millions of dollars from people whose interests are in the plant-based community so lest anyone listening to this believe that harvard is unbiased they are not and the irony is that in the podcast with james wilkes and, and chris Kresser, and people say oh it's harvard it must be great exactly scary it's very scary um but that that group is completely plant biased yes 
And yeah. it's, fo- it's so ironic because in the podcast between James Wilkes and Chris Kresser, James Wilkes is trying to make a point that industry-funded studies are four to six times more likely to find in favor. And he's trying to point the finger at animal-based lobbyists. But, you know, and, fact- I, and I know these individuals and, um, you know, you've got when it comes to funding, and listen, I did research. I was at WashU, and and we get funding. For, you know, you get funding from people. You need funding to produce science, but animal based funding is scrutinized. So the the studies, the ran, the randomized control trials, and they have to be done extremely well and extremely exposed. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. not the quality of the studies are totally different. And it does make sense that plants are going to, that plant groups are going to uh, support plant based uh, studies. That makes sense. And animal groups are going to support animal based studies. It makes sense. But the quality of the research is two totally different stories. Yeah. And for people to try and invalidate all of the research that might have an iota of funding from an animal-based industry makes no sense. It's it's kind of it's it's hyperbole, and it's to me it's overgeneralization, and it's very unfortunate that they're just trying to undercut a lot of really good science. So, and there's irony in the fact, like I'm pointing out that, and as we're pointing out that this school of public health at Harvard is highly biased. I mean, I can't even open you know, and I can't even open the emails anymore. I know. It's, I mean, it's just so bad. It's crazy. So let's talk about your time at WashU because I want to talk about the fMRI studies that I've heard you talk yeah. about. These are really interesting. So tell me about that because when you were in, was that your fellowship? I did it. Yeah. So I did a fellowship for two years at WashU in um, obesity medicine and geriatrics, mm-hmm. and it was interesting. And I'm actually glad I get the opportunity to talk about it. What we looked at was the interface between obesity and cognitive decline. Okay. So. People say, oh, obesity, medicine, and geriatrics, those are two totally separate phenomenons, you know, or two separate, you know, entities of medicine. They're not. Obesity, midlife obesity, issues with being over fat and under muscled create this cascade and trajectory of later life aging, right? So dementia, Alzheimer's, vascular dementia, mild cognitive impairment. These are all obesogenic diseases. You know, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, these are, it's type three diabetes of the brain. Right. It's insulin resistance in the brain. That's exact, you know, and, and you could have vascular, you know, it could be vascular disease, it could be insulin resistance, but make no mistake, the one of the biggest issues is midlife obesity, high carbohydrates, you know, so we, so one of the part of the study, the study, you know, uh, I don't know if it has been published yet. You know, these studies are very long, um, very long, costs a lot of money to do. We're talking years. Um, so when I was working on it, one of the, one of the parts, the parts that I contributed to, I did a lot. I did fat biopsies, muscle biopsies, you know, cardiac testing and cognitive testing. And that was very interesting. And it was really a turning point in my career when I would go and, and they, this was in the, um, it was a metabolic unit. So they, what that means for the listener is that there are places in the hospital that are dedicated just for research. And it was a, a clinical research unit where we keep people for 24 hours or however long they're doing the study. Um, and you do you glycemic insulin clamps there. Mm-hmm. So the patients that I would biopsy for the muscle biopsies. So we looked at a whole bunch of different things and, um, They were at the CRU, which is the clinical research unit, and I would go and do cognitive testing on them. And that would be processing speed, executive function, uh, just a whole battery of tests. It's neurocognitive testing, which is, as you know, being, you know, training in psychiatry is exhaustive. And um, we would also look at their brain in fMRI. And you could see early on just the changes in brain matter. With obesity, yeah, or so, insulin resistance. Well, obesity really, you know, it's, you know, it's hard to say exactly which, but without a doubt, the wider the waistline, the lower the brain volume. Scary, <laughs> inverse terrifying. correlation. It's terrifying. Have you seen the study that was done? Terrifying. You've, brought, I'm sure, you're very familiar with the study that correlated levels of B12 in the body with brain size. 
very, it was a really interesting study. No, but I'd love to see it. Yeah, it's a fascinating study. Basically, what they found was that the more B12 people had in their body, the bigger the brain. No surprise there, right? And where do we get right. B12? Well, contrary to what James Wilkes might eating, think. Eating dirt or something? <laughs> yeah, right. Like, what was it? <laughs> he, he it's tried, so bad. He tried to claim that you could get B12 from dirt, but the study that he cited was an anthropologic study saying that there was a group of indigenous people who would get B12 from dirt because the vegetables were grown in human manure. It's called night soil. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> yeah. So if you eat your own poop, you can get B12 from the bacteria in your gut, and then it can go in your stomach and get redigested. But it, short of that, B12 in the soil is all analogs that don't mm. really work in human cognition. So it's a fascinating study. And I believe in that study on B12 and brain size, there's unpublished data that looked at vegans and vegetarians and correlated their brain size. Their brain size was like a whole, uh, like it was a whole standard deviation lower than omnivores brain size. That's interesting. And the largest vegan or vegetarian brain was smaller than the smallest omnivore brain. So these the brain size is a it's an interesting measure and so yeah you saw it correlate with obesity it is right so for you know that was that was the research that was being done at the time was as it related to obesity right and to see if it if it you know could go back did it well i mean i was only there two years right. so who knows how long but not really mm. You know, I mean, again, you have to understand, though, that the time frame at each individual was with the study that, that you probably wouldn't see any kind of change in that way um, based on that time. But it's uh, preventable. These are preventable illnesses. And you can only imagine that a smaller brain has to do with neuronal atrophy. And that can't be a good thing. No. It cannot be a good thing. No. And there wasn't there another series of studies that you did with fMRI looking at satiety and protein? So that's Heather Lighty's mm -hmm. uh, work, and that's very interesting. And she would, and we utilized some of her research. You know how it works in research lab is you, you gather studies and you learn from all the other labs. And one of the things that she would look at is um, breakfast skipping or, you know, high carbohydrate breakfast. And mm -hmm. what did that look like later on in terms of the brain and the brain pathways lighting up for cravings later on down the line. Right. And we know that high carbohydrate diets really affect just much more than just insulin, mm -hmm. but it affects neurotransmitters. And didn't it, didn't a high protein meal in the morning affect satiety yes. positively? Yes. It in increased satiation. Later in the day. So you were less likely to binge or overeat or do whatever you're going to do. When you had a high protein meal that's in the right. morning. Yeah, that, that's pretty cool. One of the other things that I want to talk to the, the share with the listeners that I heard you do, you did an awesome recent Q&A on your Instagram with Don Lehman, and you guys were talking about volume of distribution of the leucine and that I just wanted yeah. to highlight oh, for people that um, one of the things I heard you guys talk about was that it's not so much body size that has to do with this leucine threshold. It has for, nothing to do, right. For muscle protein synthesis. Nothing to it's, do with body size. It's just your blood volume. And yeah. the blood volume isn't that different between people. Correct. So it's not that, you know, Sean Baker needs 3.2 grams Correct. of leucine to get, he probably still only needs about 2.6 or yep. slightly more. That's you right. Know, than in one of us. So and that, that's a huge myth that people say, well, I, you know, well, there's a sex difference. There's not. It's uh, a blood volume and it's a lean muscle mass issue. It's not a male, female, you know, when you're talking about building muscle and testosterone hormonally, there are different things. But when you are talking about how much protein you need to maintain muscle tissue, how much protein you need to build muscle tissue, how much leucine you need to stimulate this process, there's no difference between men and women, no, large, small no. people. It's all about the same, which makes it very easy and takes away the over complication that we're hearing. Right. I mean, everyone's making the people make things so complicated, right? It's not 2.6 grams of leucine <laughs> I mean, like, about stimulating. There, there are a lot of things that are way complicated, but this doesn't have to be one of them. So for, let's circle back to my parents, right? Yeah. They're 69 years old. Congratulations. <laughs> happy birthday guys. <laughs> You're still alive. I'm happy they're still here, but I, you know, I've heard you talk about this on other podcasts, the typical diet, like I asked my mom what she eats for breakfast and it might be like a piece of fruit and an egg. Brutal. Not enough protein to yeah. stimulate muscle protein synthesis. No, and you know, the first meal of the day is the one that you really wanna get right. It sets the trajectory for, and so, yeah. So, and it's so funny because as a carnivore, and I think you're probably the same way, my first meal of the day is always probably about a pound of meat, right? And a lot of people are like, I can't eat steak for breakfast, but we probably need to be eating a big piece of meat for breakfast. Or just push it back. You know, 
I mean, if they don't want to have it for breakfast, don't eat it at 8 a.m. Eat mm-hmm. it at 12. Okay. Make that your first meal. But the no first problem. meal probably needs to be... It should be protein. A you big, should be protein-centric. And to get that 2.6 grams of leucine um, in meat, you're going to need about, what, like 25 to 30... At least 30. 30 grams? Around 30, uh, th- around 30 grams of... Of total uh, protein, which yeah. would be three to four ounces. Yes. Uh, you know, so in fairness... If anyone is aging who's listening to this podcast, which I don't know, you probably have some people. I'm sure. Okay. In all fairness, if they didn't want to eat meat, Mm -hmm. whey protein would work. Whey protein supplementation. So, yes. And the reason I say that is because let's say they don't want to eat meat. I, no one listening to you unless they're like totally hating on you and just wanting to listen. Who is listening so to this they, that doesn't eat meat? <laughs> you so all eat can. meat. I know you do. <laughs> but let's say they're not. Um, in all fairness, it's much better to give them another option, you know, the aging population. And whey protein works really well with that. If they're not sensitive to dairy, I think it would be a great option. And there are plenty of... And they may be. Listen, right. dairy sensitivity is a real thing, but I am hard pressed to say I'd rather have them eating the one egg and the fruit than giving them something that they may be sensitive to. I'd much rather give them whey protein. Right. If they're not willing to eat, you know, any kind of meat or or something along those lines, it's much more detrimental to continue to uh, under stimulate a process and really push that pathway of sarcopenia. Mm-hmm. So like for my mom, what I'm thinking is I need to have her, because she can't do dairy. She has an idiopathic arthritis and... Uh, an autoimmune thyroid disease Mm. and can clearly tell when her body gets triggered by dairy, even if she does like a grass fed way or anything like that. So I'm thinking for her, what she's going to need is probably four ounces of meat in the morning or ground. So there's some studies that show that, that that ground Uh works better because of, um, it's easier to digest. So minced beef, there's, I think it's Costanza's. I'm not sure, but there's a mince, there's some minced beef studies. So she needs to have like a pretty good size hamburger in the morning. I mean, listen, we need to be great. Like, because (laughs) it'd be great. I think it's cultural, and I think it is. um, It is a conditioning thing that we're not used to eating hamburgers and steak in the morning. It's true, but I think that would like change the world. It would steak for breakfast. <laughs> it's like, it would definitely change the trajectory of aging. Right. I'm sure you've seen some of Doug Patton Jones's work. I have not seen his work okay. specifically. So he shows there's just he's done a really great job in terms of aging when it comes to aging and protein requirements. And you know, it's not a slow, steady decline. It's you get sick and you stop training, you lose tissue. Mm-hmm. We're talking about muscle mass. You um, are older and you you know, whatever, mess up your ankle, break your ankle. It's not, it's very sharp, the loss. And you want to make sure that it's recoverable. You got to keep that life force up. <laughs> yeah. I got to keep my parents with life force. So for my parents, I'm thinking three to four, at least probably three to four ounces of meat in the morning. And then ground would be great. Ground beef would be great in the morning. And then if they can do that two, another two, one or two times during the day, they're going to get that it, stimulus that would twice be, a day. It would be great. I mean, so as you age, it, as you age, it'd be really great for them to get it three times. Um, fasting is not great for an aging population. Right. Uh, it's just not. The tissue is, you're having trouble with it as is. And what's so funny is that this is, I know. This is the I narrative, understand. right? I understand. Is, is, and it's the single worst piece of advice that could be given. And the, the dangerous part, it's not going to be reversible. It is not going to be fixable. Once they lose that. Muscle mass? Yeah. Or once they are injured and they can't recover. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's not something like, oh, yeah, you know, I totally screwed up. Oops, sorry. That was really bad information I gave you. I mean, you're talking to a population that their flexibility is much less. It really puts them at risk. It's like driving around a car without airbags or something. It's, you know, once they have, like you talked about earlier, once they have that defining event, they break a hip. If they don't have that amino acid reserve of muscles, they are going to be much more likely to die. Well, to and and then you're talking about feeding them. And what are you going to give them? You're going to give them salad so that they can get better? Bad idea. Salad's not getting anybody better. <laughs> I mean, it's the truth. Yeah. Right? So, you know, you're talking about a nutrient-dense food. Beef is what I believe to be as the superfood, right? The original OG superfood. Pretty much. But it's, um, you know, has all these nutrients. like zinc and b12 and 
carnitine and choline and carnosine and, and creatine. Yeah, and creatine. Name it. You know? the, the studies around creatine supplementation in vegetarians are fascinating to me. The ones where they can show that vegetarians get smarter when you give them creatine, to me, is the strongest indictment you know against a plant-based diet ever if you can make a vegetarian smarter that means they got dumber right <laughs> they got dumber when they stopped eating meat and that's no disrespect to anyone who's on a plant-based diet listening but listen if you're not eating if we're not getting i mean we're talking about protein and amino acids and we're just we're just coming back to leucine but i, I love that you highlighted this there are so many other nutrients that will come with those muscle triggering amino acids, the branched chain yeah. amino acids that will also improve overall health. And so you heard it here first. We're rebranding breakfast. <laughs> Steak for <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> Hamburgers for breakfast. Hashtag. So what's your diet like these days? I've heard you say that you're mostly carnivore, pretty yeah. much carnivore. Tell me, what do you eat these days? So um, my, for breakfast. my husband calls it prison food. <laughs> and actually we should ask him. <laughs> we should get him back in here. We can. Uh, we should get him back in here. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to get him in? Sure, yeah, let's get him. Hold on. All right, so what are you eating for your diet? For breakfast. So my husband calls this fondly prison food. And actually, I have to tell you the truth, I'm not eating a ton of beef these days. I'm really going hardcore on the bison. I love it. Um, yeah, it's pretty much uh, breakfast is what... Uh, <laughs> he says That's this big day. <laughs> It's prison food. So uh, largely ground bison. So that ground is, bison in the morning. I, would you say lots of eggs? I would say if you're cooking it, maybe. Um, and uh, that's probably the majority of it. It's not much else. Simple. Very simple. A lot of ground bison. Yes. And eggs. Um, I'll throw in some jalapenos once in a while. Okay. I mean, really basic. That's like the Joe Rogan diet. <laughs> <laughs> this is the truth. It's really basic. What about organ meats? Do you ever do organ meats? I do. Um, so that would be, uh, you see, some liver, liver, chicken liver. Perfect. We're easy. I mean, I'm super easy. I mean, isn't it beautifully simple that that's about all you need as a human? Yeah. You know? And you don't have to think about it. So it doesn't become complicated. Right. And there's... Uh, you know, I mean, I've eaten this way for years uh -huh. and I've, I mean, I just feel much better. Um, so you're pretty low carb. You're not having many carbs. I, so I've always been low carb. Interesting. I did eat carbs when I was pregnant because I was so sick. Uh -huh. And I mean, you, there's nothing you, I mean, you can only vomit so many times a day. Right. Brutal. But uh, yeah, I'm always been low carb. And essentially a meat based diet is not low carb because you're, generating you're getting carbo for every 100 grams of protein you're getting 60 grams of carbohydrates right you can turn the carbohydrates into yeah. glucose if you need them but i don't particularly eat carbs right and it's not that i'm against him i just you don't why yeah gross well i think that as we talked about if you're talking about nutrient density you're just not going to get it in a carbohydrate meal you know it's yeah, it's, I mean, listen, there's other things, you know, and actually I was thinking about this in terms of supplementation for what I'm taking. You know, I take uh, lutein and zeaxanthin and, and stuff that I wouldn't be able to get from a meat-based diet, which I think is valuable. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I Actually, it's it's interesting you said that, that a meat-based diet is not low carb. That's actually very insightful. Yeah. But And I think that's why we need to rebrand a lot of these keto words because yeah. a carnivore diet is probably not extremely ketogenic. It's not. It's so carnivore, and that's what it's so interesting is people are saying the carnivore diet is a ketogenic diet. It's not. It's, and it's also which not. Which not be a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. And it's also not a low carb diet. Right. It's traditionally thought of a low, as a low carb diet because you're not eating carbs, but your body is generating those carbs. You're eating carbohydrates in the way of eating protein. Exactly. But you're getting your carbs. And so, I mean, this kind of circles back to all these other discussions that I've had recently around um, glycogen repletion in muscles. And I think that what we will find when we do the studies is that, and the faster study really showed this, is that if we have enough protein, even on a quote unquote zero carb diet, we will have the same amount of glycogen as somebody that's eating a high carbohydrate diet. And we get the benefits of not having carbohydrates or we get a nutrient, a more nutrient dense diet from the animal foods. Yeah. So that's awesome. All right, we got a bonus podcast. Yeah, guest. we're gonna hand it over to Shane. to Shane. <laughs> yeah, thanks. We'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> thanks for coming on, my man. I didn't know yeah, I was gonna thanks, get a two for here. Me. This is cool. So, so your wife tells me that I should ask you about the plant-based Navy Seal. 
<laughs> well, that that was very short lived. <laughs> <laughs> was it you or was it someone else? Oh, it was definitely not me. Okay, no, you're too no, wise for that. <laughs> yeah, we had this guy who came into work and he said, "Oh, my wife made me watch Game Changers," and so we decided to go vegan. My blood couldn't have been better. And uh, yeah, so then we went to Africa and we got a chef and he was making these meals. And I think, you know, we'd have lo mein or we'd have beef stew or beef and onions. And so he'd ask for the vegan alternative. And, you know, he showed up one day. It was hilarious. We looked in there, we had our meal and then we looked at his and it was just the onions or it was just the, just the mushroom. <laughs> You'd have this little portion of, of side vegetables and I uh, quickly learned you, you can't go vegan in Africa. And uh, they're just looking at this guy. What are you doing? We would kill to have meat. <laughs> the people who are indigenous Africans were saying that. Yeah. Our cook, he's just looking at him like he's crazy. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. I mean, it was hilarious. And did he, his performance suffer? Uh, he lasted. He lasted a week. <laughs> he went back to eating meat. Right, he, it was not sustainable. Right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I don't know what his diet was prior. You know, I saw in Game Changers the guys are eating fried chicken every day, and then they ate something else, and their bloods are better because right. they're vegan. Well, you could literally eat anything else other than fried chicken every day. Exactly. So I don't know what he was on prior, but it was definitely completely unsustainable on a deployment as a CEO and you know, in a third world country. And uh, it's pretty, pretty funny to laugh at. So what's your diet like these days? Are you eating prison food as well? Or are you a little more varied? I'm on the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon prison food <laughs> diet, but uh, I like to get my coffee and five or six eggs in the morning uh -huh. and uh, ground beef, ground bison. I eat carbs. I have not been able to convert. What yeah. kind of carbs, what kind of carbs do you prefer? I like oats. I okay. like sweet potatoes, purple, orange, Various colors. All right. I'm into chili. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, all the man food. <laughs> what else? What else do I like? I like, you know, dairy-free free, dairy free creamer in my coffee. Wanna, <laughs> you know, I take her seals in my practice. It's like, it's different. They have a more metabolic flexibility than any group I've ever seen. Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like it works for me. Uh huh. What did you guys eat on deployment? Or what did you find on your deployments in terms of performance with your food? Were you able to kind of make that? I guess the, yeah. the food is probably pretty limited, but did you notice any correlations between what you were eating on the deployments and your performance? Definitely high protein, and it was all just real food-based for the most part. Uh, we would have a cook or a chef, depending on where we were at. Sometimes we were way in the sticks, living in a village with just you know Afghans or Mud Hut Village of Africa. And we were way out there, but we'd still have a, a cook and they'd food drop us some, some, some food and they'd cook for us. But I think definitely having access to food all the time and having access to the gym and a lot of time with nothing to do, uh, cause you can't leave your house. If you can imagine, you can't leave your house every day and you can't go do anything. So all you do is work out and eat. Right. Uh, so, you know, meat, vegetables, potatoes, um, mostly real food. Basic whole foods. So we weren't eating a bunch of junk and bars and processed stuff for the most part interesting so interesting. the seals knew that like the real food was what they needed yeah and i mean if you go on an op you you pack an mre or we'll have protein shakes and stuff like mm -hmm. that um on the side but for the most part real food when you were in some of these deployments i guess were you around like indigenous peoples did you see how yeah. they were eating like what did you observe about that yeah um i don't know how they ate every day but we had a few joint dinners so we sat down with the afghans they invited us over and we would have lamb it was you know freshly slaughtered lamb they prepared for us with rice and a curry and it was delicious did and they eat the organs tea. organs too um definitely in africa they did for sure what'd you see um, any 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 brains any brains my man <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> you know i was trying to put on some medical training and train these guys on surgical airways because i was a medic and, you know, I would, I would try to go purchase goat heads with the neck attached. And apparently it was a hot commodity. So, <laughs> you know, I had to get in line to get the goat heads with the neck. That's the best Every, part, dude. You know, so my dogs got to eat lots of trachea and uh, all that, you know. But I'm surprised. I don't know what, what people are into. Brain, maybe. Brain. Who knows? I think there's but, a lot of good tissue around the head. But I know heart and liver. Those were good. Those mm -hmm. were good hot items. And those were commonly eaten in those countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in Uganda. That was one of the, that was a hot spot there. Yeah. And you're in medical school now. I am. Yep. How's it going? 
I love it. It's uh, it's tough. It was an adjustment, but I'm doing what I love and it's great. So knowing what you know, I imagine that you've learned a lot through osmosis from your wife, you know, yep. <laughs> and, and, and you've seen her practice and we'll have to do another podcast with you guys in a couple of years. Are you seeing, is it hard to be in medical school knowing what you know about medicine and health? Are you seeing a discordance between what they're teaching you and what you may have seen to be true through Gabrielle or is, has that not happened so much yet? Well, I can't speak for every medical school and I go to Rutgers right now, but from all my friends or Gabrielle or people who I know who went to medical school before, they say they didn't teach us this or that. And I feel like they're doing a really good job. They're teaching us a lot of genetics and they're teaching us a lot of uh, different insightful nutrition classes. And that's amazing. I think, you know, and they're very uh, innovative classes on cancer and different th subjects. And I feel like they're, times have changed and they're really doing a good job and, and maybe things have shifted and I, I can't speak for every medical school, but it, it feels that way where I'm going. You heard it here guys. If you want to go to medical school, apply to Rutgers <laughs> because I didn't get any nutritional training in my medical school. Gabrielle, you may have, um, and, and we have the interest groups and we have lunch lectures that happen all the time. And you'd be surprised. You, you have everything you could be interested in and someone's coming to talk about it and you can get some free Korean barbecue while you're at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they bribe you guys. That may or may not be on the, the plan. <laughs> That's how Don't they bribe my you wife. <laughs> well, I appreciate you guys both coming on the podcast. The last question that I always ask everyone is what is the most radical thing that you guys, and you can answer for both of you. So Shane, what do you think that is the most radical thing that your family, you and Gabrielle and Aries, have done in the last month? Uh, had a baby. Oh, that was five months ago. <laughs> uh, I mean, okay, so five months ago, five months ago, you had a pretty radical baby. That's mm -hmm. a big deal. What about? I mean, that we can do that. Or what? What happened in the last month? Like, what's what's radical in the last month for you guys? We went through renovations at our condo because we found mold in the HVAC system oh, and laundry no. room that we just happened to get tested because she wasn't feeling too hot. And turned out there's a whole bunch of mold. We found black mold. So we had to evacuate the house for a week. And it was just, of course, when her dad flew in town from South America. My mother was tag team, you know, tagging him out to come visit. And I had finals. And it was just a... Uh, it was interesting, you know, but we got we got through it all, got it all done, and everything's better. But it was. I think that's easy. But anyway, that's the quote most radical thing. Everything's easy for her. She's a stud. <laughs> <laughs> Me, I was sitting there just staring at these uh, pressure volume loops, you know. <laughs> but okay, so this is this is a good question for you, and then we'll wrap it up. How does medical school compare to being in the Navy SEALs? <laughs> it's it's different, you know. Um, <clears throat> It's hard in a different way. Maybe, you know, it's the mental version of SEAL training in a sense. Um, being a transition to a full-time student was definitely an adjustment, you know, but. Well, wait a second. So you had a baby and then a month, you got out of the SEAL teams in July, had a baby in August. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up. <laughs> yeah. I so grew Shane's, up real fast. Yeah. <laughs> I got out of the Navy had a baby, started grad school, moved to New York City from rural North Carolina, um, got married, everything, all within, you know, a month. So, and then we had the baby and I missed a one out of three weeks right before the midterm and, you know. Hey, tell people where they can find me. All uh, right. So, yeah, so that's what I was going to say. <laughs> so, so where can people find both of you guys? So, where can people find you, Gabrielle? At... D R Gabrielle Lyon L Y O N. That's on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Me. You got a website too, right? Yeah, it's going through a rough rebrand right now. So I have a website, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Okay. Um, got a book with it. Will probably be coming out by this time next year. Awesome. Um, it's a book on Lion Protocol. Awesome. You know, optimizing your life with protein. 
I'm sure the name is going to go through some clever name, a couple names, but we won't say what that is. <laughs> oh, I thought um, it was about uh, a yep. pea protein or something. <laughs> it's not. No, oh, okay. You're not funny. <laughs> anyway, um, and then I do have a weekly newsletter and that I always try to put some good evidence-based information. Awesome. Where can well be, done. And where can people can, find that? They can sign that up. They can sign up that on my uh, website. And it's drgabriellelion.com. Yes. And she's also got a link on her Instagram profile. Yes, you do. That's plus one husband point. <laughs> oh, it link. So there's a link on your Instagram profile to these newsletter web, to the newsletter and the yep. websites. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you guys both for coming on. We got the bonus for the Aries. We got yeah. the five month old who is being really calm and good. Maybe Aries will say something, but um, that's awesome. <laughs> thank <laughs> Thanks for coming on, guys. So Thanks. Yeah, what's up, you guys? All right. Thanks for listening to that one. Thanks to Dr. Gabrielle Lyon for coming on. I thought it was so interesting to have a conversation with her about protein and the fact that protein is really our life force, that if we don't get enough protein, we will lose lean muscle mass. And Dr. Lyon is right when she says that muscle is the organ of longevity. Muscle is the organ into which glucose is exposed and one of the key organs in insulin resistance. We know that adipocytes in the liver also um, determine insulin sensitivity, but if we do not have enough muscle, we are in dire straits and our life force bar, if you guys heard me talk about that in the podcast and have played video games, is low. And like, like Dr. Lyon says, if we get into a situation where we're recovering, where we're in the hospital and we lose muscle mass, we die. That is what kills cancer patients. Often it's cachexia, which is loss of lean muscle mass. Having more lean muscle mass on our bodies is how we become long-lived healthy people. And this is in stark contrast to much of the message that is being put out there, I believe wrongly, by people who are fear-mongering around animal protein. And I have discussed this time and time again. I debated Dr. Gundry about it on a previous podcast that you can find on YouTube, on my channel. And uh, next week's podcast is gonna be with a gentleman named James Clement, who wrote a book called Switch, which is all about mTOR, and it will continue this conversation about animal protein and relation to mTOR in detail. So this, this podcast and next week's podcast will complement each other well. Um, Dr. Lyon and Dr. Clement have different views, and as you guys will know, I am generally uh, of the opinion that animal protein is a very good thing. There's some nuance that you'll hear in next week's podcast with James, and I think you guys will, uh, it will not be surprising to hear that that generally involves intermittent fasting, not turning mTOR on all the time, but we absolutely need mTOR, and we need not fear turning mTOR on with animal protein. That is misguided. That is so misguided. I would challenge uh, any of these pundits in the space to really show me evidence that animal protein directly leads to cancer. That is just not true. And as we talk about in this podcast, it is really based on faulty evidence, generally on ad libitum, uh, which is overfeeding, essentially. It means the mice can eat as much as they want. They overfeed protein in addition to other junk in their diet, and then it gets attributed to the protein. I don't buy it for one second. I think that if we had better models, we would see that protein is not causing cancer. It doesn't make any sense. As Dr. Lyon points out, obesity is probably the major risk factor, and eating a lot of protein is probably going to put us in the other direction of obesity. So what is going on with me? I'm hanging out in San Diego. It's been beautiful since the first of the year. I've been getting in some surfing, been getting in the ocean, been getting in the sun, getting my UV light. You guys may have seen a post at an Instagram about ultraviolet light affecting gut microbiota diversity positively. And guess what? Fiber doesn't increase microbiota diversity in the gut, but ultraviolet light does. Getting my ultraviolet light. I'm heading to Texas this next week. You guys, many of you, when you listen to this, I will be in Austin. So if people are in Austin, reach out to me on Instagram. Let's hang out. I'm going to be shooting bows and I'm actually going hunting next weekend with some good buddies, including Carnivore Kurt, Kyle Kingsbury, and others in Austin so we can respectfully harvest and gather animals in the wilderness and kind of unplug a little bit. So I will be in the woods and I will be sharing my hunting trip with you all. So I appreciate you all very much. Please support the sponsors. White Oak is doing the work that we need. Ancestral Supplements is an amazing company bringing us grass-fed, grass-finished, desiccated, freeze-dried organ supplements. They are whiteoakpastures.com, ancestralsupplements.com. The codes are Carnivore MD at White Oak Pastures, Carnivore 15 at White Oak Pastures, and Saladino MD at the Ancestral Supplements site on Shopify for 10% off with my code. And that is it for this week, you guys. Stay radical. Appreciate you all so much. And I will see you next week. Like I said, it should be James Clement. And he is a longevity scientist. We are going to go deep further down into mTOR longevity and animal protein. And 
uh, yeah, we mix it up a little bit. So, all right, you guys, stay radical. Check out my T-shirt. Please leave me a review for this podcast. Love and appreciate you all. Peace out. Stay radical.